Sucks that it's raining today while I'm recording. Lighting won't be as good. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I want to talk to you about a piece of software that I think deserves a lot more attention. And by the title of this video, you probably already know what it's going to be about. It's a new and hip database called Norio. Nine. What career? Not a database. Career! It's actually a data flow engine that acts like a database, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of people covering Noria, even though I think it's a really cool piece of software. The only video on YouTube is a talk by one of its creators, John Jensett. And by the way, John does live coding streams on his channel, where you can follow along and learn advanced topics in Rust, such as async await, pinning, smart pointers, and so on. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend checking out his channel, link in the video description. I'll also be linking all the resources I use to learn about Noria. So first I'll be going over what Noria is trying to solve, then I'll be going over some of its design choices, benchmarks, and features. And finally I'll be talking about some of the trade-offs of Noria if you are to use it in a production setting. So Noria's target is mainly web applications, specifically applications that are read-heavy, which most web applications fall under. These web apps most likely interact with some sort of database, with the majority of its accesses being reads. And if you imagine the server recomputing the same SQL select statement over and over, but the results never change, then that's a lot of wasted CPU cycles and unnecessary latency. To combat this, developers either pre-compute these values beforehand, or use a caching system like Redis or Memcached to minimize database lookups and increase performance. The problem with this approach is that application logic dramatically increases in complexity. The application now needs to know when to evict entries in the cache, when to invalidate entries, and when to update entries. And John mentions this in his talk as well, where there's a chance that all clients miss the cache at the same time, then all the clients query the database at the same time, causing the database to crash. Another solution to this is using stream processing systems like Apache Spark, where data is processed as it comes in, and query results are updated as needed. But these solutions aren't as flexible. You usually have to specify beforehand the queries that you want to keep track of, and to limit the memory use of these systems, they usually implement a windowed system where only the most recent data is kept, say, this week's weather or today's news. So Noria basically combines all of these together. And if you think about it, the database already knows your query patterns and can efficiently maintain a cache for you. Created from the results of a research paper in 2015, Noria is written entirely in Rust. It describes itself as a new streaming data flow system that acts as a fast storage backend for read-heavy web applications. So here are some benchmarks that they ran. It's comparing Noria with MariaDB, SystemZ, MariaDB with Memcached, and just Memcached. We see that Noria basically beats everything except for Memcached. But even then, Noria actually scales better than Memcached because Noria doesn't have any locking mechanisms, which I'll get into later. On top of that, the Memcached setup is unrealistic because it's not persistent and it doesn't account for double incrementing. Here's another benchmark, this time with a uniform distribution of requests, and we see that Noria is still comparable to Memcached. And it's only when there's a lot of writes that Noria begins to fall off, but this is to be expected since Memcached is only writing to RAM. There are two main ways of interacting with Noria. One is through the Rust bindings, and the other is through a MySQL adapter. You can also manually query Noria using any MySQL client. So Noria's data flow system is implemented as a directed acyclic graph of relational operators, such as aggregations, joins, filters, and so on. The base tables are the roots of the graph and the views are the leaves of the graph. Any update starts at the base tables and propagate downwards. From my understanding, the data is held inside the operators and they're combined together to make the views. The operators can either be partially stateful or fully stateful depending on the data it is holding. And while the base tables are stored in persistent storage, the views and operators are stored in system memory. So in John's talk, he mentions three major challenges that Noria had to overcome. The first one is the problem of limited memory. You can't just keep caching things and not evict any of them. The second thing is application changes. The application is going to query different things over time. The new data becomes old data. And the last one is rewrite concurrency. Having the ability to read and write concurrently is the key to performance. So let's go through each of these one by one. The first one is no infinite memory. By Noria's design, you can probably already tell that the views are sharing operators between each other to save memory and computation. And as I mentioned before, Noria can have partial state. This means Noria can evict only parts of a view and leave the rest intact. For example, evicting data from years ago and only keeping the recent ones that are accessed frequently. 
Contrast that with existing materialized views where it's all or nothing. From their testing, they ran Noria with Lobsters, which is a open source clone of Reddit. They ran it with normal Lobster workload, then they ran it with 10x that. So from their paper, it says that the base tables were 137 megabytes. With normal workload, Noria was able to serve 2,300 pages per second using 525 megabytes for its working set, or 3.8 times the size of the base tables. So this part I didn't really understand. They said they did 10x production. So I'm assuming the base tables are now 1.3 gigabytes. And they say that Noria can still meet sub 100 millisecond latency with 95% of requests at 2,300 pages per second. As long as Noria is given more than 2.6 gigabytes of memory for its working set, or 3x the base tables, but 2.6 gigabytes is not 3x 1.3 gigabytes. So I'm not really sure what they were talking about here. So the next one is application changes. So queries to your application is gonna change over time. Maybe you add more columns or you add new features. So some of the challenges that Noria is going to have is avoiding duplicating state and maintaining read write while it's transitioning. So the query sent to Noria can be broken down into changes needed for the existing workflow to be changed to a new workflow. Planning and transition consists of creating an augmented query graph. A query graph is basically a data structure that lets you optimize multiple queries together. Each node represents a table or view, and each edge represents joins or group by clauses. So Noria uses this to inexpensively eliminate redundant data and map out all the shared data. The query graph gets converted into IR, which then gets merged with existing IR. Then this repeats until all the IR is merged. So one thing to ask is what happens if you delete a column from a base table, but there still exists operators out there that still require that column. So Noria's base tables actually keeps track of all columns, including deleted ones. So when a write occurs, Noria fills all those columns with default values. That way operators are still happy. So here are some more benchmarks. You can see that the write throughput drops after the transition, but the read is still pretty good. And the last thing is read-write concurrency. So this is the part that John talked about in his talk, and it's really interesting. So what Noria does is it keeps two maps around, and then two pointers, one point into each map. One is for all the readers, and the other one is for all the writers. The writer writes to its own map, and then the reader reads from the other map. The writer applies its changes to its map, and then the reader and writer swaps maps. So to achieve the performance that Noria has, Noria doesn't use any locking mechanisms. So how do we know that there's no data races when we're swapping maps? To make sure that there's no reader still reading the map, each reader has a local count associated to them. And the readers increment the counter once before the read and once after the read. Then when the writer sees that all the readers are even, then it knows that no reader is currently reading the map and we can safely do a swap. And this data structure is actually available as a Rust crate called EVMAP, which I'll link in the video description as well. So what are some of the trade-offs for using Noria? Well, first it's really, really fast and really, really concurrent. And from the benchmarks, you can see that it's very performant. But there are some reasons why you might not want to use Noria. First of all, it has really good sharding support, but its fault tolerance for sharding is not very good. Right now, if one of the shards go down, all of its state is going to be lost and you'll have to recompute all the lost state. Another thing is it doesn't support certain SQL keywords like range. One last thing is it only guarantees eventual consistency. So if you do it right, it might not be reflected by the reads until a while later. Well, now it stopped raining and the sun is out. And that's pretty much it for this video. Hope you guys learned something new. Like, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video.